into the period of the Roaring Twenties. The thing that I want you to put at the very top of this paper for the Roaring Twenties is I want you to put Wild Crazy Party. Wild Crazy Party. Because that really is how the Roaring Twenties is described. It is one giant party. Again, yeah, that giant party was a direct cause of the Great Depression. But again, we had a great 10 years. Okay? Now, in terms of the Roaring Twenties, which, by the way, this first term is a starred term. Please go ahead and star the Roaring Twenties. Basically, what you need to know about that is this first bullet that's on your paper, which is that we're going to enter this massive period of economic, so what I would highlight is economic and cultural change. Basically, we become an entire new nation. Now, if you will box where it says HC, that is your historical context. Why did this happen? And you need to star that because you need to know why the Roaring Twenties occurred. So first off is World War I factory use. More factories, more jobs, more money that people can spend. Two is that uh, people have uh, new technologies, right? New technologies, new wealth. That means more money for you. Uh, one thing is women breaking the cult of domesticity, and we'll talk about that when we get to women's rights. And then new money of people wanting to spend things. Now, before we get to the 20s, there is one thing I need to mention, and that's about uh, Warren G. Harding. Um, Harding is typically, and I'm going to knock on wood a little bit, he typically has one thing that is mentioned about him, and it's mentioned about every other year on the AP exam. Okay? Now, he might come up in this thing called uh, normalcy, which if you want to highlight, it's basically a return to a new kind of normal. After World War I, he says we need to become normal again, get out of this war and become Americans. Uh, become Americans. So again, where it says return to a new kind of normal. But the big thing that you need to know about him that is often asked on the AP exam, if you will star, the Teapot Dome Scandal. And this is one of those random terms that the AP exam absolutely loves. So here's basically what happens with the Teapot Dome. Harding needs oil for the U.S. Navy. He looks around the United States and he finds this perfect location at a place called the Teapot Dome. The reason it's called the Teapot Dome is because they have this formation that looks like a teapot. Um, if you see it, you see the little spot right here. See, it's a teapot. Well, it's called the Teapot Dome, so it's supposed to look like it. Now, what happens is they begin to get oil from it, but only a few months later, it's discovered that the owner of the land that they bought is besties with Warren G. Harding. So there's a term that we learned is an alliteration that has to do with this. Okay, Stephen, you've like killed it today. You've got to let other people have their turn. Stephen's, Stephen's overdoing it today. We, can, you, can you come down to like a B minus level today? Yeah, just for, you're doing awesome. But uh, I would love to hear that side as in everybody but Stephen side of the room. Okay? I am. He's very, very smart. So other than Stephen, okay, what is this an example of? The spoil system, right? So what happens is Warren G. Harding, this basically makes him look awful. Uh, he ends up declining a second term because of the fact that he was probably going to leave. Yeah, I thought he died. Yeah, so he so let me explain. Okay, before he died, he declined going for a second term because of the fact that he knew he wasn't gonna win. And then supposedly he died because everybody hated him, that's what the rumor is. But <laughs> Ask Donald Trump right now and Zinc. Because this is exactly what happened in Zinc when we went over the spoil system. Um, is if you guys remember, we talked about how um, after Hurricane Irma, oh my gosh, Maria, Maria, yes, I don't know why I said Irma, Irma. So after Hurricane Maria that devastated Puerto Rico, remember we talked about this, is that uh, they hired a utility company to go and restore power. When they began to restore power, it was alleged that the head of that company was like the brother-in-law of Zeke. And Zeke said, oh, I didn't know that at all. That wasn't my thing. I had no idea about that. And it ended up almost causing Zeke to completely lose his job. Um, but Donald Trump supported him, so that's why he didn't lose his job. Um, but because of the fact that supposedly he had given somebody he knew power in the government. So that's the thing here, is that who's getting the most money from this? 
the, his best friend. Wait, so is that possible? Zink is the Secretary of the Interior. Yeah. yeah. Very, very popular in the state of Utah. Yes. He's actually extremely popular in Utah. Uh, so this, by the way, ruins Warren G. Harding's presidency. It mars him um, for life and again, supposedly he did die of sadness. So, But that brings us to... We are going to, for right now, because I'm not 100% sure what we will get done, we're going to go ahead and skip down on this, and if you will skip down to women's rights. Oh, but communism. We'll talk about communism, but I know what's on the quiz next class, and I would rather make sure you have what's on the quiz. So, skip it down. <coughs> Hold on. Okay, because... Shh. Listen, I want to make sure I get through the stuff that's on your quiz for sure, rather than focus on other things. So that brings us to our major revolutions, and the first is going to be starting with women's rights. If you will star this, it is very commonly asked about, because this really becomes the first major revolution for women's rights. And it starts, if you will highlight, the 19th Amendment, and I would also star that. There are certain amendments you need to know. Yeah. Women's rights is one of them. One way that you can remember women's rights, by the way, 19th Amendment was passed in Congress in 1919. Okay, that's one way to help your timeline. Now, technically, it did not go into effect until 1920, which is why next year, with the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, they're doing all these really huge women's rights um, activities throughout the United States, including the state of Utah. Um, but Is that why they were, like, wearing the white things or whatever? Yeah, so that, so that actually is, so what Stephen, again, we're supposed to be a B-minus student right now. Uh, no, that's not it at all. Um, actually, I was speaking very highly of you to the substitute yesterday, so. Um, I speak highly of every single one of you. Every, every time I say, let me tell you about my students, I name all 235 of them. <laughs> yes. Okay, so uh, what he's talking about is during the State of the Union, um, all the women, I believe it was, I can't remember if it was, I think it was the Senate, wore white in recognition of the women's rights suffrage 100th anniversary. Okay? I think it was all the Democrat women, something like that. Uh, now, what happens with the women's rights movement, women's right, women gain the right to vote. So what you need to know in the 19th Amendment, women gain the right to vote, fancy word, suffrage. If you will put next to the second bullet, H.C., H.C. Basically, women break the cult of domesticity during World War I. Remember all those war production jobs, things like that? They say if we can do what a man can do, then we should have the right to be able to vote. Now, this brings us to the flappers, which if you will go ahead and star this, is the flappers. Now, the flappers, if you will highlight, are the fashionable, scandalous women. And then if you will circle, underline, star, the gender norms. They are going to break the gender norms. Now, I am warning you, as we go through the next set of pictures, you are about to see pictures that are very scandalous and promiscuous and sexy. Okay? Be aware of that as we go along. Do not be too offended by these scantily clad women that we are about to see. Now, in the 1920s, prior to this time when women are asking for suffrage, this is the traditional woman. Now, these are actually considered scandalous in 1919 when they're campaigning. Reason why? You can see their ankles. Again, please do not be offended. We will all survive. Okay? Now, what happens is... Okay, listen. So what happens is that following the women's suffrage movement, women now say, we have the right to vote. Therefore, we have the right to push back our gender norms and be who we want to be. Now, this begins in an era known as the flappers. Now, around Halloween, women dress up with these all the time. The costumes you typically see with the flappers look like this. A um, little bit more scantily clad than they actually were in the 1920s. Uh, one thing I want you to notice, though, from this picture is if you notice what's in her hand, and it's not a wand. That's what 2B said. It is a cigarette. That's right. That's a really long cigarette. It's a cigarette. Well, that's how it used to be back then. Because you couldn't condense nicotine into such a small thing, so they had to elongate it because of the technology at the time. Right. Yeah. What's the difference between a cigarette and a cigarette? A, cigar. a c cigarette and a cigar. Do cigars are well, like I, I, well, I'll tell you, I, I don't know a ton about them because I don't smoke at all, and I don't know anybody who smokes. 
Um, but I know that uh, the cigars are made from a lot more heavy of a plant-based, and so they tend to have a lot more nicotine in it. Uh, they also produce a ton more smoke, uh, which is why you can like smoke in certain places, but you can't smoke cigars um, because cigars are much more heavy. That's why you have to go to like an actual cigar bar in a lot of cities and states to smoke your cigars outside of your house. Gotcha. Yeah. So one thing, though, that I want you to put next to the flappers is if you will write down the word fringe. Fringe? fringe. Like their dresses or the, of society? No, of their dresses. Oh, okay. F-R-I-N-G-E. And you can see that right here. So with the fringe, let me explain why women begin to wear fringe uh, during the 1920s, okay? So if you have fringe on your skirt and you walk around back and forth, and the fringe sways beside you. What shows underneath that fringe? Legs. Your legs. Oh, yeah. And that's what they want to do. They want to show all that really attractive leg. And so they're going to wear their skirts with fringe. Now, the reason they are called flappers is because as a flapper walks, her fringe flaps against her body and she shows her skin. So, again, as I show you this picture, just we can get through it together. Ready? <gasps> Gasp. Oh, hey. Oh, Stephen, where are you? I know. Now, in today's world, would this be considered scantily clad? Not really. Not really. But in the 1920s, this woman, I mean, we're talking public shaming, kicked out of their house. Many states had it illegal to wear skirts this low or this short. Uh, so what happens is, but these women, they're like, we don't care. We don't care about the law. We're going to push it, and we're going to wear whatever we want to wear. And so what happens is, is that these women begin to get shorter and shorter and shorter skirts. This woman on the right, if you could think of the worst thing that you can call a woman, that's what she was called in the 1920s, and it, which is interesting because we don't see it as that in today's world. People wear those shorter skirts all the time right now. And so what happens is, though, is that these women are considered promiscuous and it begins a more sexual revolution for women where they feel like they don't have to follow what standards say. Now, one interesting way, though, that the cities do attempt to fight back on this is to create laws. For example, there were laws of how short your skirt and your swimsuit was. In the 1920s, a woman's swimsuit that was considered appropriate, the bottoms actually came down to your knees and cut off right at the knees. There was laws that were passed, in particular New York is the most famous for this, where if you had too short of either a skirt or in particular a swimsuit, you could be fined the equivalent in today's world of about $500 per instance. That was the ticket cost. Uh, so imagine in today's world if some cops were hanging out around the beach and they came up to you and they pulled out their ruler, like, let's see if your swimsuit is too short. Uh, that's what happens back in the 1920s. Um, now, these women... It wasn't just the flapper dresses. These were also considered scantily dressed, scandalous women. And again, we don't see that in today's world. But remember, before, all those skirts came down past your ankles. Now, all of a sudden, women are able to be able to show off their skin. Now, one really good example of, like, the flappers in the 1920s is the book called The Great Gatsby. It's used oftentimes. I did see a ton of people. I have this one kid that never does my work. He always reads The Great Gatsby in class. So I'm assuming what some class book. is doing yeah. The Great Gatsby. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a really good book, tons of symbolism, but it's all about the 1920s. So in this book, the women are drinking. You might say no now, but once you find out the symbolism, I promise with you. Oh, it's, it's not. Okay. I think Myrtle. All right, listen. Okay, so what happens though is the Great Gatsby is a really great example of how all this kind of came to be in these parties. Now, one thing that happens with this scantily clad woman, though, is they are going to begin to develop dances in order to further women's progress in society. Now, we're going to watch a video right now of the dances. And what I want you to think of is what does this have to do with the flappers? Think of what the flappers are trying to do and why these dances would continue that. Um, also, one thing I want you to think of, too, is really until like the 90s, Every era has their dances, and during PE classes, you would learn the dances. I want you to imagine having to learn these dances because they were required, like they had choreographed dances during like proms and stuff. So imagine when we're watching this, if you guys had to go to prom, you had to perform these dances. 
So, well, so we'll, well, actually, we're going to talk about Footloose in a second. Okay, so again, as we watch this, what does this have to do with the flapper movement? <laughs> Quiet. You had to go to learn those in PE and you had to perform them at prom. Okay, now it was awful. It was awful. I thought it looked fun. Um, now these, well, it does look hard. Um, but these dance moves, though, begin to become crazes, especially with women who are trying to be flappers. Why would these dances benefit the flapper movement? Yes. What? Say it louder. Your dress goes up. Yeah. How many times did they, like, kick their legs back and forth? Or, like, flip around? Every time. And what do you see underneath? All those nice legs. So what happens is women begin to encourage the use of these, like, more scanty, scantily, more risque dancing, like you guys saw in that. So, again, that was considered risque at the time. Is doing those moves to show that leg. And so I think it was you that was saying footloose. So that was a real thing. Uh, states and cities and schools actually began to ban things like this because they said it was too inappropriate for schools. So they started to ban these, and then Phyllis really was a real thing, especially in the South. Um, now, in terms of... Okay. That brings us to a really fun topic, which is going to be prohibition. Now, this is a starred term. It's very important to know. You're just going to start every term? I think we have already. Here's what I will, here's what I'll tell you. There's a rumor. Okay. And I'll show you this towards the end of the year. Uh, this really fancy schmancy teacher went and did every single topic since they rewrote the exam in 2014, took every DBQ, LEQ, SEQ that they've ever asked on and made a chart. And there are only five topics that have never been asked on since the rewrite. Uh -oh. One of those is the 1920s in terms of the stuff we're talking about now and the Great Depression. And so they're thinking it might be an LEQ, DBQ question this year. It's either on this. They did last year ask about migration during 1920s, huh, Sam? Yes. Yep. Wrong, Sam, but thank you. Oh. Okay. So uh, last year they did ask on the Great Migration on the SAQ, but it was not the full SAQ. But they do think that there might be a 1920s or Great Depression New Deal question this year. But I also really like this topic, so... That kind of goes there. So prohibition, you need to highlight that prohibition banned the sale, manufacture, and consumption of alcohol. Now, the reasons for this is exactly what we talked about before. What is the term that we learned before that was where they asked you to abstain from alcohol? Temperance, temperance, temperance. right? So temperance movement is really your historical context here. Basically, what they're trying to say is it's unpatriotic. Uh, if you drink alcohol, domestic violence goes up, all these different problems. They campaign, they campaign, they campaign, especially with gaining, women gaining more rights in World War I. It ends up leading to the passage of two important amendments, or one amendment, I guess I to say. If you will highlight the 18th Amendment, the 21st Amendment, and then if you will write between them or maybe bracket them and make sure you know the difference. And I have a great way to be able to remember the difference between the 18th and the 19th, or the 21st Amendment. Okay? At 18, you can, so I'll, you're also doing really well. We need to knock you down, too. Okay. So at 18, you can't drink, but at 21, you can. And that's how you remember it. 18 years old, bans the 18th Amendment bans the sale of alcohol. You can't drink at 18. 21st Amendment repeals it. You can drink at 21. That's the best way to be able to remember it. 
Now, the biggest thing that you need to know, though, about prohibition is if you will write next to it, failure, or I'm even thinking to put down, like, epic fail, because it really was. It was one of the worst things ever. It was a total failure. Um, I would say the one positive thing that happens is the FBI becomes more powerful, but prohibition was a complete failure. So we're going to go through why it was such a failure. So the first one that I would highlight, I believe it's the fourth bullet, fourth bullet is what is known as a speakeasy. <laughs> now, a speakeasy was a secret bar, secret saloon. If you've ever seen a movie, which somebody pointed out last class was in Shrek 2. Ella, you were, when I said to knock down, I didn't mean read a book. Oh, you just got caught. Okay. So, with, in, they said it was in Shrek 2, but if you guys ever seen the movies where you go up and you, like, knock the door three times, the little window opens and they say password. Like in the Great Gatsby. Or in the Great, Ga well, the Great Gatsby is about the 1920s, so yes. Or in Tangled, okay. So, those are considered a speakeasy. So in real life, you would go up, you'd knock on the door, they'd open it up, and you would be at the secret saloon and bar. When we talk about the impact of prohibition, prior to this passage of this law, there were 15,000 bars in New York State. Six years later, after the Pro Prohibition Act is passed, that number rises to 33,000. Okay? So when we talk about, was prohibition successful in stopping alcoholism? No. no. In fact... If you actually look at charts of alcoholism, it skyrocketed during the Prohibition era. Now, one other thing, though, that happens is you also have the creation of moonshine. If you also highlight moonshine. Okay. So let's talk about moonshine. Now, one thing I will tell you is a lot of people relate Prohibition to a lot of things that are going on in today's world. So you'll see a lot of similarities. And one of those is through the creation of moonshine. Oh, by the way, one thing about speakeasies that I forgot to mention, speakeasies were also a really interesting place because you would go into the speakeasy, you'd sit down with your drink, and next to you would be like the chief of police or the mayor of the town. So everybody who was anybody was there. Do you want to go get a drink? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so what happens is, is that alcoholism is going to rise. Now, there are certain things that are life lessons that you should learn in this class. One life lesson, never, ever, ever drink moonshine, okay? First off, it's illegal at any age. Don't drink moonshine, and I'll explain why. Moonshine was basically people's attempt to make homemade alcohol. Now, it's not saying if your parents brew their own beer that it's illegal. That's, although in the state of Utah, I can't Probably. remember. There's certain rules with it. Idaho, you can, but I think in Utah, there's like weird laws. But that's not what I'm saying. Moonshine is a specific type of alcohol. So in terms of alcohol right now, their two strongest alcohols are typically whiskey or tequila. Those drinks typically have about 40% alcohol content. Moonshine has about 90% alcohol content. Okay? Well, you say yum until you die. Okay? So the problem is, is that first off, because of the distilling, they're having pure alcohol come out of it, which is high, high, high alcohol content. Well, there's another problem, too. You see, when alcohol is illegal, can you just go down to, like, Walmart and say, hey, can I have my moonshine supplies? No, it's illegal. It's against the law. So you have to find new ways to create basically a factory without going and getting factory goods from a store. So they do two things. First, they use old farming equipment. And second, they use car radiators um, to be able to make this. Here's the thing, though. Do you want to drink something that just came out of a car radiator? No. And because they weren't, they're not sanitized. And because they weren't sanitized, the big thing that happens that I would put next to moonshine is lead. People begin to get lead poisoning in a massive amount because it's being cycled through this very dangerous thing. So not only are you consuming lead, you're consuming 90% alcohol. Moonshine directly leads to a massive skyrocketing in alcohol-related deaths and also massive skyrocketing in blindness because if you drink one thing of moonshine per day for six months, that's typically when you will go fully blind is after six months from having so much lead in your system. Very, very dangerous. Now, why is it called moonshine, do you think? Because you do it for the moonshine. You, well, yes, you're making moonshine, but why is it called moonshine? It's you do it at night, right? Are you going to go out in the middle of the day and go make your moonshine? No. 
So you would make your illegal alcohol at night, calling it moonshine. Another way to be able to sneak it around, because these are typically in very small remote areas, especially in forests, they would actually take their shoes and put these little things underneath it so that when you walk through the forest, it looks like you're just an animal. So somebody's walking in the forest like, oh, cute, there's a little elk walking around. No, it's not. It's a moonshiner going to make an alcohol, okay? Uh, so this ends up kind of skyrocketing. Now, again, lessons to learn from this. There was a school about two years ago that was teaching the 1920s. The student body in the junior class said, you know, it sounds fun. We should make moonshine. <laughs> and around 90% of the 11th grade student body went to the hospital for about four weeks, okay? And they almost died. It's because, no, they drank it. They didn't just make it and say, oh, this was fun, let's go home. <laughs> they, they did drink it. Um, and it ended up being a huge problem. So things you shouldn't do because it is illegal, okay? You can't go off and make this because of the high alcohol content, okay? So please don't. And also just don't drink in general because it's bad. All right. Now, the one thing, though, that happens is because of this and because, because moonshine is so dangerous, this rises what's known as the bootleggers, okay? So the bootleggers, which if you will, uh, I think you have to actually write this underneath. If you'll write it next to the organized crime, bootleggers are people who are going to illegally transport alcohol, very similar in today's world to like a drug deal, okay? Their job is to transport, listen, their job is to transport alcohol back and forth across borders, especially from the Caribbean islands. And the thing that happens is because of this bootlegging, they need somebody in charge, and that's going to lead to the rise of, and if you will highlight this one too, organized crime. Now, organized crime in today's world is very similar to like a cartel, okay? So what happens is, is that the whole purpose of this organized crime is to basically be able to run the bootlegging operations. Now, the problem, though, is that this creates both the mob and the mafia, they are the exact same thing, except members of the mafia have to be um, either of Italian heritage or they have to marry into the family. Now, as you guys know, the mafia is probably the most famous one because of their very drastic techniques of punishing those who um, have gotten them in trouble. While these guys are just probably going to shoot you, they go a little bit more fancy in the mafia. Like if you want to... Fun fact story. Severed horse heads. Yeah, so severed horse heads or the concrete, yeah, it's called the cement shoes or the concrete oh, yeah. shoes, which is basically where uh, if you tattle, they sit you in a chair, they tie your hands behind your back, they put your feet into concrete, and they let you sit there so you know what's happening. It takes about eight hours for it to harden. You know what's happening, but you have to sit there like an almost psychological torture, and they throw you into a river and you drown. Now, here's an interesting story of the modern day. The mafia does still exist. Um, we have the Italian mafia, especially in New York and New Jersey. We also have the Russian mafia. If you want an interesting story in terms of how the mafia gets what they want, uh, I had this is like a secondhand story, and it was actually from a student. Uh, so one of my former students had a brother serve a mission in Italy. While he was in Italy, they ended up uh, starting to teach this girl. Turns out she was the daughter of the mafia boss of the city. Uh, they went over there one day, and they were sitting there meeting with them. And uh, they told about how when they were coming in a few days earlier, um, somebody had stolen the suitcase of a brand-new missionary. And the mafia dad overheard, and he comes in, and he's like, hey, can you tell me that story again, what happened? And they tell him the story, he's like, I'll, I'll try to figure it out for you. They go out to eat. They come back to their house, which had been completely locked. They open up their house door. The suitcase is on the bed. Everything completely folded as if nothing had been touched and a thousand dollars sitting in cash on the top. And he said, I've taken care of it. <laughs> so when we talk about like this thing and he just said he never asked any questions. So it got returned. That's all I know. But this kind of thing, though, is about this idea of getting things done at this time. Did you have a question? Oh, I was just going to say my brother served in Russia with the, yeah. and he dealt with the mob a lot. Yeah. Like, investigators would just like disappear yeah yeah um i i had a student last class I, I have actually had multiple students say they wanted to marry into the mafia please just understand the possible downsides my dad grew up in new jersey so he probably knows them so i could like
I will say every couple of months you see some big murder that happened where like three, four people of Italian heritage get killed. It is typically because of the mafia. I was born in New Jersey. That's great. No, that's 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 cool. Okay, yes. I'm from Yeah. And so my grandparents are from Italy, and they know like a bunch of people that are like in the mafia. So Very cool. She's probably in danger right now. No, I'm sure you're fine. You're fine. Now, one thing about this, though, so if you've seen, like, The Godfather, that's an example of the mafia. Um, but in terms of the mob, though, the mob is going to be the one that's more famous. Now, their most famous weapon of choice is going to be the Tommy gun, handheld machine gun. Uh, this ends up leading to the rise of the FBI in order to be able to come back. Yes. Okay. Listen, guys. Listen. So what happens, though, is the rise of the FBI becomes big because they're trying to combat this. But, of course, we all know that there's one really, really, really famous mobster. And who's the most famous? Al Capone. Al Capone, that's right. And anybody know what city he's in? Chicago. Wow, last, the last class only one person knew, so good job. Well, I so Al Capone – oh, okay, cool. So in Al Capone, or with Al Capone, Al Capone is going to be in Chicago. And he has a bitter rival on the other side of the city – who's going to be a guy named Bugs Moran. And they are total rivals, very similar to turf wars in today's world. Al Capone decides it's time to get rid of Bugs Moran. So these bootleggers call up Bugs... Okay. Call up... Okay, we're not going to get done, and then you're not going to have the information for your quiz. Okay. So he calls up Bugs Moran and says, Hey, I have all this illegal moonshine and all this bootleg stuff. Come and be here. It's going to be real cheap. It's all going to be good. Bugs Moran and 18 of his best men go to meet up with these alleged bootleggers. When they arrive, though, it turns out it's a police sting. The police show up. They say, you're under arrest for bootlegging. They have the Tommy guns on them. They say, put your hands up. They drop their weapons. They put their hands up, turn against the wall to be arrested. The police then open fire, killing all of them. These were not the police. These were all of Al Capone's men. This was all a setup. This is what's called uh, the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Now, what happens, though, is that people begin to rush out, see what's going on with all this fighting. Well, do you have to call the police if the police are already there? No. No? Nope. So the police investigate, take interviews, evidence, get in their car, drive away. Those people were Al Capone's men, and they leave. And they're never identified. None of this is ever solved. Um, now, the one thing is, and this is not teaching you to procrastinate, but if you want to learn about why procrastination is good sometimes, <laughs> Bugs Moran was supposed to be here with his top men. And this was all of his top men, the top people of his mob. However, his barber had run late to his haircutting appointment, <laughs> did his haircut too late, and he shows up 15 minutes after his scheduled murder. So uh, procrastination is not always good, but if you're about to be murdered, it could be good. So take that into consideration a little bit. Okay? Uh, now... One thing as well about this, though, is Al Capone does eventually get arrested, and he gets sentenced and puts into this prison, which is where? Alcatraz. Alcatraz, Alcatraz. good. Uh, but he was not there for murder, even though they say he was responsible for 510 deaths. That's not why he gets arrested. Uh, he tax fraud. Tax fraud, that's right, tax fraud and tax evasion. He never gets charged with any of his murders or crimes. Now, Alcatraz becomes the most famous place for the mobsters and the gangsters to go. Uh, very, very famous in the 1920s. It was actually a former World War I prison for POWs. Um, but Alcatraz is in the center of San Francisco Bay. And if you don't know, the currents there are absolutely crazy. It's probably the reason why they say it's unescapable, because if you go into the river, you're going to be swept out to the ocean. Except according to these three, because these three think they can be able to escape. Now, two of these over here are brothers. Another one was an inmate, and they decide they're going to escape from Alcatraz. Now, other than, by the way, one person or I think it was a group of people that escaped on the ferry, this is the only known one where, there's a, where they escaped as it actually went across the ocean without automatically dying or being swept away to sea as far as they're aware. What happens is they come up with a plan. Now, over the next six, seven months, they have stolen spoons from the uh, cafeteria. They take out the grates at night and they begin to scrape away the extremely weak um, I wonder if this is going out, because that usually doesn't do that. Uh, the extremely weak drywall around this box. As they begin to scrape that away, another person in the group, who was a worker at the barber shop, begins to take hair and steals it away. 
They begin to make these different masks in order to be able to place them there at night so it appears that they can, are still asleep. The plan is, at night, they will go out, they will climb through the vents, up to the top, and escape and in a raincoat-created raft and escape across San Francisco Bay. Now, that was the goal. So they began to escape, and the goal was to take the currents and have it hit right here. The problem is, is with the current system, if you go under the Golden Gate Bridge, because of the way the currents are, it's pretty much impossible to get to the sea. So the goal is get over here before they get to the Golden Gate Bridge. So they begin this plan, and they put their heads out. What's one thing you're noticing about the heads? Well, yes, there is no body. <laughs> you're not wrong. How many are there? Four. But how many were in the previous picture? Three. So what's the problem? Well, this is why procrastination is a bad thing. So they actually had a fourth guy named Alan West, and you can actually see how bad of a procrastinator is because he only got half of his face done compared to the others. Alan West did begin to attempt to be able to escape with them. He was along with the whole ride, but he had a little bit of a procrastination streak. It took him a lot longer to get things done. Because it was taking things longer for him to get done, he wasn't ready when they suddenly had to move up the escape a week because of a guard change. The guard change happens. They decide we're doing it tonight. They all go to escape. Alan West, who is frantically trying to carve out his hole to escape, tries to fit through the hole, is not small enough to get through it, and gets stuck. Everybody else leaves him behind. And part of the reason we know about this whole plot is because Alan West because of this escape at the time was a capital offense, is trying to escape the death penalty, tells everybody the entire plan. There's only ever been two artifacts that have been found from this escape attempt. They have found one paddle and one life jacket, and that is it. Now, 90% of the historians say that based on the current system, based on no evidence, they were more than likely swept out to sea, drowned, whatever it could possibly be. Except, two years ago, a documentary comes out uh -oh. on the History Channel from the family who sponsors it. According to them, up until the 1970s, which is about 15 years after they escaped, they had been receiving multiple letters from the two brothers who said that they had escaped, gone to Brazil, and lived in Brazil um, for the rest of their lives. And then the letters mysteriously stopped starving in the 80s, which would make sense because they were probably dead at that point of old age. Uh, handwriting analysis, they've gone through the FBI and things like that, multiple handwriting analysis Experts say that the handwriting is the same as the handwriting that was found in the jail cells of these people. So according to the family, they escaped. What happened is up to you, though. So that's your little mystery for the day. Okay? So moving on from prohibition, though, I need you to take your paper and flip it over. And we are actually going to skip down all the way to the end. And we are going to skip down to where it says the Great Migration. And the reason why is, again, we have to kind of focus on the things that are on the quiz. I thought that would be more important to you. Did you say, or we just don't teach anything? No, I said we don't do the quiz. Or we just don't do the quiz. Yeah, that, that's also an option. Um, I'll think about that one. Really? Yeah, I will definitely consider it super hard. Okay. I mean, my, my husband and I have a, a video game date night tonight. So I'll definitely think about that when I'm doing that. No, it's legitimately what we do. That's what we do every Friday night is we play four hours of video games with each other. What video games? Right now, well, right now it's Red Dead Redemption. Because we have dueling Xboxes, so they're right next to each other. So we play our games, and then we get on a party with each other. And so we're sitting right next to each other with our two screens, and then we just talk to each other over headphones. It's great. Okay. Well, because you can't have the headphones off because you have to listen so you know what's going on in the storyline. What if your kid doesn't like video games? We don't talk like that in our family. <laughs> um, we, we, <laughs> no. I, I think based on psychology of children and how children typically take habits from their parents, I'm guessing that. But the problem that, and we were actually just talking about this, the language in Red Dead Redemption is not appropriate for a child. Um, so we have discussed how we're going to try to fix that. Okay. Haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> and then you just put the kid over in the corner and be like, stay over there. Yeah. All right. So great migration. This is a star term. This was actually last year's one of their required SAQs was on the great migration. Now, this is part two of the great mi migration. Hey, by the way, are you still working at Smith's? 
No, you already asked that. I know, but I, every time I go to Smith, I think of you, and you're never there. Yeah, no, Sam B. <laughs> He bagged my groceries one time. It was great. And then I almost hit him with my car another day. Okay. All right. So the Great Migration, this is part two. So we did part one, which remember, what is part one? Where are they moving to? Hey, listen. Bigger cities in search of jobs. Part two is if you will put it next to African Americans. So this is part two of the Great Migration, which is the movement of African Americans. And they're going to go, if you will highlight, the rural south to the urban north. And in particular, they're going for factory work. Now, if you will start the second bullet, which is the cause, it's going to be World War I factories. Making more money, they want more opportunities, they go north. Prior to this time, does anybody remember, we learned it in the past, what is the primary job of African Americans in the south? Sharecropping. Sharecropping, right? So why would I want to stay in sharecropping when I can make all this money in the north? So they begin to do mass migration up into the north, which is called the Great Migration. There's two Great Migrations. This is the first period of the 1920s. Um, and if you see from this picture, which is a Harlem Renaissance painting, uh, is that you can see that they're going to go to the industrial cities, Chicago, New York, St. Louis, where there's large amounts of factories. Now, this time period, though, also leads to, and this is a, I would say Great Migration might be one star, and the two-star is going to be the Harlem Renaissance. And they have never asked a DBQ or an LEQ on the Harlem Renaissance. Okay? So I, I mean, with so much emphasis now on minorities, I would think about that. What I would highlight on here is this is going to be the cultural, social, and artistic explosion. Specifically in Harlem, New York. So remember, New York, big factory city. Harlem becomes an area where it's low income. African Americans don't have income, so they flock to Harlem. It becomes a very much black community uh, in Harlem, New York. And so they begin to have a whole bunch of explosion of really, if you want to maybe put next to Harlem Renaissance, I would put black culture. This is when African Americans begin to start their cultural revolution. And then if you will also put in parentheses there, I would do start of civil rights movement. This is oftentimes used as a historical context with a 1960s essay because it starts the, the movement. And if you will put that your examples, put number one is going to be jazz music and number two is going to be poetry. Now what happens is that this becomes an artistic explosion. In the South, with the KKK and the rise of violence, you can't just go and have some sort of a speakeasy for African Americans. That would be against the law, discrimination, Jim Crow laws, right? Now in New York, they're free from violence, and they can be able to go and be able to have their own identity. Now, one common way they do this is through the jazz music. Before, if you were a black musician, you weren't allowed to perform, especially in the South. Now with these speakeasies, they're able to be able to start the jazz age and start this huge artistic explosion. In fact, a lot of radio stations banned jazz because they said that that was the African-American music, right? You can't listen to that. Well, the thing is, when they're here in Harlem, New York, they can have that. Now, one of the most famous jazz musicians of this time period is a guy named Louis Armstrong. What's his most famous song? What a Wonderful World. What a Wonderful World. Okay. Which, fun fact, is also Miss Ray's wedding song. So you can say Miss Ray's happiness is partially because of the Harlem Renaissance. Thanks, Louie. Yeah. <laughs> you can write that into an essay oh, on the Harlem Renaissance. They'll stare at you weird. Uh, now the, well, we can't because we have like one minute. So the last thing, though, that you need to say, this is important, is Langston Hughes. If you will highlight Langston Hughes. And don't put your stuff away because I need to tell you something. So Langston Hughes is going to be a very famous poet during the 1920s. During his poetry, he is going to basically say these are the problems with African Americans. So if you want to put next to Langston Hughes, I would put the word plight, P-L-I-G-H-T, of African Americans. He basically says these are the problems. We're living in poverty. We have no money. We're discriminated against. If you want an interesting fact, if you want to put next to this to remind yourselves and put the word rap, when 1989 comes around and the rap movement starts in America and they begin to rap about discrimination, violence, things like that, even Tupac himself actually said Langston Hughes was his inspiration because of the Harlem Renaissance. And that's it. What?